Welcome to the HDG Stories Podcast, where we'll share our threads of memories, knowledge, experience, and history, knitting all generations into a beautiful tapestry. So please like and share, and be sure to subscribe. Now let's get started. But it's, it's interesting because when I tell people about it, I always describe it as if, you're, if you stand with the lock house to your right and look diagonally up in that parking area, you'll see a little bridge. And it goes yes. over a creek. Yes. I said, if you go up there, then you'll see a little playground. You can have a picnic there. And it's amazing how many people I've sent up there with kids. They can, they can really run in that. And it's usually not as busy as it is down around the lighthouse area. I've had people come back and thank me. And I'm familiar, of course, with the North Park Trail. There's a couple things I wanted. I wanted a little kind of the story of the trail, and maybe you include that give your tour. Do you talk about how the trail was built, or do you, or is it more specific? I mainly talk about nature, environment, and history on the trail, and which is only it's an hour and a half. In fact, I'm doing one Saturday. The blazes are interesting. I don't know if you want me to say anything about blazes. That's how we mark the trail. That's how trails are marked around the world, and we use the same convention you know, with paint on telephone poles or rocks or trees or whatever. Okay, what the blazes mean? Well, if you go on the North Park Trail, you'll see there's two blazes, a white one and a blue one. Now, the white one is the North Park Loop Trail. Loop meaning you end up back where you started. The blue one is the Mason-Dixon Trail that runs from Harrisburg to Philadelphia, like 175 or 80 miles long. When you see blazes, if you see two blazes, that's a very important thing. That means the trail is changing direction. If the left one is higher than the right, you turn left. If the right one is higher than the left, you turn right. And if there's one, that basically is, you're on the right track, keep going. Now, that trail has many more blazes than a normal trail would have, because what we have done over the years is taken school students back there. I try to explain this blaze business to them since it's done, quote, universally. And I put lots of them up there so that they get... The idea of, gee, I'm looking at a blaze, I'm looking at a blaze. Maybe they'll sink in the next time they go to Susquehanna. Oh, so you're saying they're closer together yes. than they normally would Yes, because I'm sure the, the hardcore trail hiker says, why in the hell are there so many blazes yeah, there? Yeah, I probably only need three. But it's a, uh, it's, it's a <laughs> learning Teaching. tool that yeah. I'm trying to do with them. Presently, it uh, basically starts at the lock house, which is actually, I tell people the lock house because if I say that, sewage pumping station at the corner of Erie and Canestio, people get a little, what's that? But anyhow, we start there, then we, through North Park, we cross Lily Run on a small bridge that has been there for probably 50 years, roughly. We go past Michael Honey Playground, we cross Fountain Run, which is the next small stream. That's one that, if you're familiar, comes down through Angel Hill Cemetery, past the old 7-Eleven, and so on. And that particular item was built by 10 or 11 of us guys. Back in 2003, we were able to, uh, you may know Alan Philippe, I was able to mm -hmm. get Alan Philippe as a retired engineer to design this thing, and he said, oh, every civil engineer should have a bridge design at least once. So he was really interested in doing that, and we did, and then scrounged about $1,200 from something called National Recreational Trails, which you can do. We bought the lumber, did all that, and we erected it in one day, which is a great thing. I mean, to start and finish, and so a tricky thing is to be a friend of mine because you might get involved in <laughs> goodness knows what. But anyhow, you go from there, then you go up to where the railroad starts, that railroad spur, and you see a, a small rail car that we have there. That rail car is what AmeriCorps, who I was able to get for about six weeks over this period of three years, we loaded it up with stone dust, which is really fine gravel, pushed it up the tracks and shoveled it off. And it's all manual pushing and, and shoving because you can't, most rails to trails programs, you have a, a service road beside it. Well, this is no service road. So the only thing you got is the width of the rails, which are, interestingly, a standard gauge rail, which is four feet, eight and a half inches, the same as a Metro liner runs on here on Amtrak. So technically speaking, the Metro liner could fit on that track. A lot of people think it's a, a narrow gauge railroad, but it's not. And the railroad, of course, was built for only one purpose, which was the construction of the dam back in 1926, and it opened in 1928. Tracks used to run down the middle of Juniata Street till about 1992. I think they 
pulled them out. That was part of the contract that the city signed way back when, almost 100 years ago now. Where did it go going north, the railroad? It stopped at the dam. You it's can walk all the way up to Balkan Quarry, then you come to a chain link fence, no trespassing, but it went through there and then through Susquehanna State Park where if you, it's a long up there, it goes, it follows the towpath of the old Susquehanna Tidewater Canal to finally it ends right there at the dam, which is you know, what they were trying to do is get material. Here it went down Juniata Street, hooks into the siding there by Huber, by the football field, and then went out past the Little League Field and hooked into what was then the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that's how they got materials got to the dam? Stuff up to the dam, yeah. Obviously a one lane track. So they had to have traffic control, and there's a siding here and there that you can get out of the way in case the train's coming. From what I can understand, no train has been down there since about the 1960s somewhere. 1972, Hurricane Agnes, if you go up in the state park, you'll see 200 yards of rails hanging out in space. So that was the death knell completely. So we didn't get started on the trail. We started about 1997. This idea came along, I guess, partly stimulated again by Anna Long, and partly because she and I were both involved with the Greenway, Laura mm -hmm. Susquehanna Heritage Greenway. And this was, I don't want to say a route. You say, hey, this might be a route to have to Grace, and so that's what we did. But when we first started, no trains had been down there for 30-some years. Mother Nature had fallen, so it was a matter of doing a lot of grubbing out just at the beginning before we could even start. Started. It was a learning curve on how do you do this. I mean, I had ideas of what I thought we could do, and some of them worked out and some of them didn't. I mean, now, it was important finding friends, and still is, with chainsaws and stuff. But the deal was early on, when you walked up the tracks, you had to step on the ties. The ties are still there, and that prevented you from looking around because you wouldn't want to fall over the ties. So I figured, gee, we got to put some surface down, so that's where we got the stone dust. And early on, how do you put it down? Well, uh, one Saturday, and I can't remember when it was, probably 1999 or something, I said, tell you what, now we've got this thing grubbed out. Let's see what we can do, put out a call for people and come with wheelbarrows. Well, we found out soon that one day, soon finished that idea. I mean, it just was not practical. Fooled around, and that's when this little rail car idea came up. Fortunately, I was able to get it from a man at Aberdeen Proving Ground who was interested in rails and rails to trails and kind of stuff. So he gave it to us and it's still up there, chained to the track because first time I had it up there, I didn't chain it to the tracks and he would find it up at the end of the trail. And so I found out like, something's got to happen here. So I did that. Anyhow, that's how the railroad gets up there. It's all blacktopped on Juniata Street. They pulled the rails out. I said it was about 1992, which was the contract that was signed between Philadelphia Electric, who's the dam guys, and the city back in 1924 or whenever it was, that whenever the city wanted them removed, they would remove them at their own expense and so on. As you go on up past there, you go underneath Route 40 Bridge, you're, you're now on, and I always, in my mind, I always take the rail side up and come back along the river because I do a lot of picking up of trash, and more trash is on the river, and I don't want to carry it up and carry it back running up. So you go up and, and very shortly, 100 yards or so, you come to a, a big pond on your left. And there's a lot of wetlands up there. Everything on your right between the rail and the river is tidal wetlands, meaning the water comes in from the river or the bay, wherever you like to think about it. The left side is all non-tidal wetlands, which means springs and stuff. So there's a really big pond, probably a couple acres pond up there that is loved by turtles because it has no shade and of course turtles being cold-blooded need that frogs do not particularly care for it at all it's interesting the turtle population has changed over time that i've been doing this early on it was basically all painted turtles the last several years i have seen an emergence of snapping turtles in the pond and i'm not sure if the snapping turtles maybe are taking over the pond or not you know starting in the end of march uh as long as it's a sunny day, they'll be sitting out there on logs and logs. whatever. And if you're not too noisy, you'll you'll see them. Also have a beaver problem, I guess I call it there. The pond has an overflow pipe that we had to put in. So if it gets too full, it 
doesn't run over the trail it runs through and right now it's fine earlier a month and a half ago i was up there every morning clearing out the beaver plugging because the water was up to the thing and it was running through and they kept trying to stop it and i kept emptying it out so finally the level has gotten down so the beavers have left it alone but there's a lot of trees cut up there you can see where the beavers have been chewing them and, mm. and what have you now you continue on up uh you'll see some wood duck boxes that were placed by uh, Harford Glen, and uh, Harford County Environmental Center, or whatever that's called up there. Uh, and these have been six or seven or eight years ago. The wood ducks are in, are losing their uh, population, and this was to encourage wood duck nesting. And apparently, wood ducks like to nest in hollow trees, but as development occurs, there's less and less hollow trees. So they, what they had is when the kids go to Harford Glen, at, I guess this was like six or seven years ago, one year they had them build these wood duck boxes, not install them, and then in the summertime the staff would come down and install them. I run into a guy from the state who does surveys of how successful they are, and his response to me is basically, these are really not very successful because I get the impression there's too much human activity around. If they were somewhere where there's no trail or whatever, it might be more. You go on a little further up, you, you'll run into, on the left-hand side again, the remains of an old quarry, which is probably the same strata of rock that, you know, Vulcan is and uh, Port Deposit is and so on. From what I can determine, it's probably something that hasn't been used since the early 1900s. Uh, it's not very big, not very impressive, but it's there. And then if you continue, you can, and maybe this is a cliff you're thinking about, you keep going up the tracks and to your right, it's all flat land over to the river, and that's the coastal plain. The hill up the side, on top, is the Piedmont Plateau. So this is where two geographic provinces, and, and the fourth grade teachers love it, because they say, you know, we teach this. But here, kids can see where the Piedmont Plateau is, places like where the community center is. They're up on the Piedmont Plateau. Down the coastal plain is, I'll call it the flat land. That's probably what made Harvard Grace a desirable place in the first place, was we're on the coastal plain, and all the way down, you know, through Aberdeen, Edgewood, that was all coastal plain, and that's why the post road was built, because it was flat. And then, of course, here, once you got here, you then had the ferry boat. And there was a ferry, as you probably know, upstream, Susquehanna Upper Ferry. But the problem there is you had to come from the coastal plain, excuse me, the Piedmont Plateau, down to the coastal plain, take the ferry boat, go on the other side, and go back up again. So, Havre de Grace, from a geographic perspective, uh, the way I understand it was desirable for transportation. And this was the main drag during the Revolutionary period and what have you. Of course, you know, Lafayette and all that. But you go on a little further, there's a place up there where some fernal pools, meaning fernal springtime. Many of these little pools are only, depends on rain. You know, if it rains hard, it may only last five or six days. But there's one on the left that is lasts usually almost all year long. and I. It may not even be quite correct to call it vernal because it lasts a long time. And it's one that you go up there in mid-March to the end of March and you will hear the spring peepers just going crazy. After that, you don't hear them anymore. They have done their thing, apparently, and uh, have all mated and are hiding in the water. They like that because that is a, a shaded pond, whereas the big pond is out in the open. No trees in the big pond, except along the edge, and it's so large, it doesn't interfere with the turtles getting uh, heat. Continue on, and, and by the way, there's four benches along the trail, two on the riverside and two on the railroad side, which were uh, an Eagle Scout project from one of the boys from Troop 967, a kid named uh, Robert Schultz. So he would put those in, and they've been very serviceable, and now they're there. You can sit down and contemplate. I found out in this, you have to be a little careful, too. I went to my good friend Clark Old at Susquehanna State Park. He designed the benches for me. He said, you don't want to make them too comfortable. You will get people, I don't want to say live in there, and you will get uh, various sexual activity <laughs> occurring there. So they're, you know, maybe only about that long, so you don't get real comfortable. They're only about that wide, but you can sit down and take a break, drink your soda, and or your beer, and, and it's interesting, soda cans and beer cans and stuff like that are a lot heavier when they're full than when they're empty. 
And people seem to be able to stand the weight when they bring them in, but can't take the empties. And the problem. And it wouldn't be so bad if they just leave them on the trail, but they feel necessity. Of Throw them over in the bushes. So you're digging through the bushes. Well, anyhow, yeah, you get past that pond and you come to, on, on the North Park Trail, the point where it makes a turn back towards the river, where there's two blazes and you can see you got to turn right. The other Mason Dixon Trail keeps keeps on going until you come up. And people say, it stops me at Arundel Quarry. And I say, well, you know, yeah, what that really means is you missed the blaze. Because there's blazes before you get to the quarry that take you left. You know where the firing range is? Police firing range? Well, I, I, yeah, I know where it's located, but I'm okay. not known from that end. Okay. <laughs> well, anyhow, it takes you up over a bunch of rocks up to the top of the Piedmont Plateau then. So you've got to crawl up over these rocks and come over. And you get on the road that goes past Meadowvale School, and there are the blazes. You keep following them, and you come out. This is the unfortunate part. At this point, you come to Route 155, and they're on the telephone poles. And you have to walk along 155 till you get to Lapidum Road, you know, Susquehanna River Hills. Then you go back down Lapidum Road for another mile and a half or whatever it is, and you're down in the state park, and again, you have the bucolic surroundings. <laughs> Is that why they wanted to get it through the quarry? Yes, exactly. Would, would you go up over that cliff, though, to get it through well, the quarry? Well, the plan is this. The 100-year plan is to, to stay along the river. But you have to wait till the quarry goes out of business for that to happen. So, who knows? The desired plan is where I talk about crawling up over these rocks. Mm -hmm. And supposedly, and if you'd asked me this 10 years ago, I'd have probably said the same thing. There's a deal with the quarry who said, yeah, we're going to make this available to you. We'll build you a switchback so you can get up on the Piedmont Plateau, and then you can still walk up the road a little bit. But before you get to Meadowvale School, you can cut off, which is, again, our property, and go through, well, it may not be the woods, you won't be on the road. And then follow that over till you come almost to Lapidum Road. And then, again, we, the quarry, own land, and you can come down to the river. Uh, I'm not holding my breath, but I'm told it's closer than it was before. There's legal issues involved. The reason the quarry don't doesn't hasn't jumped on this too hard is they have real liability concerns because you're you've seen the hole up there, and I presume you have. Mm -hmm. And John Q. Public is very curious. Somebody got to fall yeah. down the hill. Yeah. And you have <laughs> That's the long term plan. Of course, then you hit the greenway down at the river, and you're see this is a Mason Dixon Trail too. Now, this trail is. Our little white trail is North Park Loop Trail, Mason Dixon Trail, and the Greenway Trail. Once the Mason Dixon Trail splits or continues on and the white trail splits off, you still have Mason Dixon and, and Greenway. And then once you get to Conowingo Dam, all you have is Mason Dixon. Back in whenever, and I can't remember whenever it was, when the quarry was trying to work with all this business of moving overburden and all this business. Some legal things were signed by, I'll say it was DNR, but I'm not sure, and the quarry, kind of assuring that you could get through the quarry. Well, I have needled the Greenway off and on, and then I have also needled the city attorneys off and on, and I've been kind of told, don't push. And that's one of the things. I've I really have three things on my bucket list that I'd like to see done on the trail. Well, that's one of them. <laughs> okay, to make that connecting link. Yeah. Now, are you allowed to go up and climb those rocks and go up? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's, it's blue blaze. It takes okay. you right past the firing range. I mean, like, how close are you to the firing range? Is that safe? I can see you've never been up there. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I could be happy to take you up there sometime. The road comes down, and you know what Loggerat Lane is where it yeah. goes back. Well, the road continues on down and then takes a left turn to go into what used to be the entrance to the quarry. It's still the administrative entrance, not where the truck is. Well, you take the left to go to the quarry, you turn right to go to the firing range. And the firing range is, they are shooting back towards the community center. They are on a shelf, like on the Piedmont Plateau, with this moor hill between them and the community center. So they're shooting, they're shooting west, I guess. Uh, and that's what I often tell people when I do these trips. I said, you, you'll come up here, you'll be here, and you'll hear lots of gunfire. Don't be alarmed. And because they shoot single shot, they shoot mm -hmm. multi-fire or clip weapons. Yeah. And you'll eventually, if you 
and you see these blazes, mm -hmm. but from where the blaze takes you up over the rocks, another 200 yards, you kind of come to the chain link fence, no trespassing mm -hmm. of uh, Bolton. And there's no camping, there's no fires back on the trail. Does that mean there is, I mean, <laughs> not permitted, does that mean there is no camping and no fires? No. <laughs> it's like the speed limit is 65 yeah. miles an hour and people go, go 90 or whatever. <laughs> exactly. But still, early on, we had a problem with, uh, I'll call it squatters living out there. And that hurt us early on in that a number of particularly women who wanted to walk the trail say, ooh, I'm not comfortable. Yeah. Uh, and we pretty well, we almost never have that problem again. Once in a while, I get a camper out there. The police are very good about it. I mean, the signs say, no, no camping. And I have a good relationship with the police department. I'll say, gee, I've got somebody camping on wherever. And they'll go up and move them along. Yeah, yeah. Them, move them along. Uh, now I'm coming back along the river. I'm okay. sorry. No. But you got to be an old railroad there. And that bridge is, from a history point of view, is about 1910. The original bridge is about 1885. The reason for the change was as locomotives got faster and faster, they wanted to one thing, they, the bridge originally was a, a one railroad track bridge, and so they wanted to make a two railroad track bridge. But the speed, from what I understand, the locomotives getting to the point where the turn before was sharper than the turn is today. So they had to widen out the turn going over there, and again also to accommodate two trains versus the one train they had. So that's when they uh, uh, were replacing that bridge and. The, and you probably know it, at one point on the Cecil County side, the bridge caved in and some cars went in the river. Early on, the B&O Railroad did not go east to Baltimore, Baltimore and Ohio. And they soon after that realized, gee, here's Philadelphia, New York, et cetera, et cetera. We're getting, we better head that direction. Well, the Pennsylvania Railroad, I don't want to say had a monopoly, but in a way. And so uh, the B&O Railroad and president at the time was John Garrett, hence Garrett Island. Probably know that's why Garrett County is Garrett County. That gives you an idea of the clout of politics and industry yeah. and money and that sort of thing. And so they went, you know, up to New York, basically. And the way I understand it is, and I don't know this for a fact, there's something about they have to do something B and O, laborsome, <laughs> to get from New Jersey to New York rather than what the Pennsylvania Railroad did. I can't remember what it was. But here's the problem when they're doing this bridge and it fell in, they're out of luck. So for a period of time, they had to make some deal with the Pennsylvania Railroad, and I'm sure they must have they gouged them, but I don't know that, to use bridge to, where am I? Yeah, the bridge yeah. right here. So then in 1910, they finally finished the bridge that you see there today, and then oh, several years back, probably 20 or more, they pulled the second set of rails off, which was the first the reason they built the bridge in the first place, because railroads are taxed by how many miles of rails you got. They pulled the track to reduce the number of rails, but that's, of course, as I said, they bought the island, and I don't know who they would have bought the island from, B&O, you know, uh, because that's where they have some bridge piers. I can't figure that out quite well. At that point, and you know, this is getting off the track, but about 12 years ago or so, Ed Abel bought the island from the B&O. My numbers are correct, like 200,000. And he was talking, whether he had real plans or not, but he was talking about going to build a development on there. Right. And then the island's all in Cecil County. You probably know that. It's yeah. in this in the Perryville city limits, so to speak. Of course, the Cecil County people got said, whoa, you know, we wanted that island to be preserved and so on. And so Gary Pencil and Peter J made a deal and bought the island, the way I understand it, for 700000 from Ed Abel. So it able makes five hundred thousand just by owning it for a bit. And the deal, the way I understand it again, was that okay, Cecil County is gonna buy pay these guys seven hundred thousand for the island and in a year and so on. Well, my understanding is four or five years go by, and these guys are still holding the island for seven hundred thousand dollars, and they said, you know, we can't do this much longer. We we're gonna market it. Well that apparently really stimulated the Cecil County people who then got the feds involved somehow or other. And the feds eventually, again, it's my understanding, you know, paid back uh, the two guys and the thing now belongs to the feds. And you know, the current interest is that it's owned by Fish and Wildlife, which 
Isn't it, isn't it part of the, what is it, Blackwater? Yep, refuge? part. There, the Blackwater right Wildlife now. Refuge is the technical landowners. Their attitude or their mission, the way I understand it, is to limit human activity. So the Cecil County people are trying to get the National Park Service to pick it up, who will then encourage. So I don't know what's good or bad for the whole island. As you probably know, there's uh, an extinct volcano dome, they call it. Mm -hmm. I call it a hernia in the earth. But yeah. but we have old pictures of the lock houses show that island with no trees on it at all. Well, I was going to say, I believe at one time it was a farm. It looks like right? it was a, uh -huh. a meadow on islands. Who owned it at that time? I have Don't no know. idea. Yeah. Well, anyhow, coming back down along the river, you can you pass. There's, there's a very interesting plant up there. There's lots of invasive plants, by the way, like there's everywhere. But there's a plant called Equisetum that most people think is bamboo. It's a much more ancient plant than bamboo. It's prehistoric. It was around when the dinosaurs were around. It's relatively rare in this part of the country. It's more a southern kind of plant. It likes swampy areas and warmer, warmer climes. E Q U I S S E T U M. I think it's the common name is horsetail. So if you look at that word, Equus, horse, sedum, tail. Zedum was not tail, but Zedum translates as like hairs. And apparently the idea is not the coarse hair on the tail of a horse. Right. But the com more common name is scouring rush. It turns out the Native Americans found they could take this plant and extract silica from the soil. The soil, you know, is like 50, 60 percent silica in the body of the plant. You take it and you can make like an SOS pad out of it. You bunch them together and you can scour out your cooking utensils. So. Our settlers going west and whatever soon learned this from the Native Americans, and they named it Scouring Rush. So it's three names, but it's all the same plant. Now that there's some, it has come and gone different places. I know that it is not the ordinary person looks at it will say that's bamboo. Sometimes it's in really bad shape. By that I mean sometimes the winters are too much for it, and sometimes they're not. Now there used to be a big patch of it over by that fernal pool that I talked about disappeared. I don't know what happened to it. I know early on when we were doing this, and the park people and environmental people said, don't say that. People will come out and pick the equisetum. Don't advertise that fact so much. You can tell people, but don't put it in your write-up. But There's a picture of it in the little brochure. Then you come on down, You two of these benches on the rail side, two of the benches on the river side. There's nice places where you can look out and and see the Ireland, you have an opportunity to talk about the river and the depth of the river. And gee, it goes 44, 444 miles up to Cooperstown, New York. And gee, the, the average flow in the river is like uh, 300,000 gallons a second past that point. And, and averages are really bad things to talk about, but that's really what it is. Uh, and then you just continue on down. You can see the where you're walking then is where really was underwater back at the canal time is where they had this big basin that I was talking about. And you can see the pilings along the river because at that point, the towpath was built in the river for where the mules walked up and down and they pulled the canal boats, which are on the inland side of the towpath because that was all flooded then. You can still see pilings remaining out there. Not too many of them. You're talking about 1840. <laughs> uh, and uh, you can see that, and then continue on down. You come to a, uh, a, a another place that was a beaver pond. The beavers moved out of there about uh, three or four years ago, but it's still a, another little place. And then come across, finally, another little a wooden walkway that we, we had a contractor build. We were able to get like $24,000, and, and this is beyond my guys <laughs> doing stuff. And that's actually the point where the tidal wetlands water comes in from the river bay and floods all these tidal wetlands back in there. You know, twice a day you have high tide, and twice a day you have low tide, so you can, can you actually see here's, here's water coming out or water coming in. And at that point, then you've now gotten to under the Route 40 bridge at the end of Lily Run, where Lily Run meets the river. And of course, Fountain Run meets Lily Run before that point. And that's where the next thing on my bucket list is. In fact, the first item on my bucket list. Uh, is we want another crossing from the Route 40 side across Lily Run to the lock house. The idea being to make it truly a loop so you don't have to double back, but more importantly, 
to increase exposure to the lock house because you probably know at the lock house we have a, we have what I think is a very nice setup, but we are divorced from the critical mass of stuff at the other end of town. Yes. And people often don't even know we exist, despite the fact that we try to advertise and people down there tell them, if you dose it at the lock house, you find this to be true and that we get a lot of visitors after four o'clock. It will be, I spent the day in half years, well, let's stop and look at that on the way out of town. Mm -hmm. But that, that happens. But uh, anyhow, and then you would have, you know, completed your loop and, and there you are. Now, what would you, you're talking, there. there's like a beachy area there, yes. right? Are you talking about putting something there? Oh, actually, or upstream, up we've had it uh, surveyed and so on. Uh, working with the state and stuff, you want to, I don't want to say you want to find a, the narrowest point, a narrow point mm -hmm. where the beach area is, is a wide. Yeah. This would be upstream from where that is probably a hundred feet. That's that's the plan, and that's you know, one of the things I would really like to see. We that has been a series of aggravations to me. To be honest with you, uh, we had the money lined up. Uh, environmental people got in the way. People who were trying to help us got in the way. Uh, so right now, it's basically in the hands of the city. We've had some geotechnical work done, which is drillings up there, to, because we're talking of putting in, I'll call it, like one of these 80 feet long golf course bridges that you often see, mm -hmm. with nothing in the water to hold it up. It's a clear span supported at each end. It's interesting, it turned out you have to get down 16 feet till you find solid Sorry. ground. <laughs> so our... That's going to add really to our cost because now we, our supports at that end are going to have to be somewhat. But that, you know, supposedly the money's there. I, I used to let this give me ulcers, not really. I was going to say, what's the environmental issue with it that you're, you're, well, first you're off, messing with all originally that we had, we were going to put pilings mm -hmm. in like the other wooden walkway that we have. Okay. Well, when you put pilings in the water, you can only do it a certain months of the year. Secondly, you now start disturbing something. We had to have a, a bog turtle survey done. We had to have an interior forested bird survey. That's not exactly the right word, but it's something like that done. Uh, Corps of Engineers, as far as clearance, and, and so it's just a, a series of things that are important, but hold you up. What do they have that's up, at, that goes up along um... The state park to the dam. What? How did they? Is that boardwalk on pilings? Okay, that. You know that area you, through as a quote swamp unquote. Yeah. Is that what? Is that is that on on just pilings or what or? Uh, as I recollect, it is. Okay. Now that's a different kind of. See, this is if you want to say it, open water, not, mm -hmm. not really, but open water. That up there is quote swamp. If, if we wanted to build. And this was in the early plan, way back when, going up the railroad side of the trail. When I say early plan, this goes back before I was involved with it. They had a dream of, we'll build one of those kind of things out into the middle of that wetlands over to the right towards the river, and then you can go over there and look at whatever you can look at, and it would know, be that kind of construction. I have no intention of promoting that. Uh, maybe somebody else will sometime, but I'm, what I'd like to do is get the the complete loop finished. Well, I had a fawn up there this day before yesterday, a small one. I mean, the problem is I'm looking for trash and cutting yeah. off stuff sticking out over the trail and probably not being real quiet and whatever. And, uh, and I have to look over the side. There's this fawn there. I looked at him a little bit, and then he took off. Are there any citizens against trash that are up there? No. We, we do all the maintenance. I do all the maintenance. I basically is. Well, what happens when you're not able to do it? Well, I'm doing green team Saturday. I'm, oh, I'm hoping okay. to stimulate yeah. the green team. Well, and, well, I was going to say, and they might, they might connect with citizens against trash, so they can get the orange shirts and stuff. And I'm hoping they will come. <laughs> they will have this epiphany. Uh, really, I have two people that are really great as far as helping. One is Frank Duncan, whom you probably don't know, but you know his wife Sharon. He is. He lives there on uh, Locust Road, if you know what I'm talking about. That little road that runs past the playground. And he goes up at least three times a day because he has two dogs. He is really great when it comes to uh, 
chainsaw and, and that sort of thing uh, and doing some weed eating. Tom Davies, another fellow who lives out Seneca Avenue, he and I have been friends for a long time through Boy Scouts and what have you. He's another one that I get to do chainsawing and he and I cut the grass. Well, it's not exactly grass, but the, <laughs> cut the stuff on the riverside with the uh, push lawnmowers that we have. Now, those two guys really help, and there are some citizens who go up there frequently, and they'll take along a, like one of these little wise bags and throw mm-hmm. stuff yeah. in. I got a fellow who comes, he's at sea like half the year, but when he's here, John Demos, uh, he probably don't know. And, and one thing that attracts people there is dogs are yes. allowed, so he brings his dog yeah. down. And you know probably, probably know Basil Coakley. Well, Basil used to walk every day up there with various dogs. And Basil still comes up but doesn't walk that much anymore. We hope you've enjoyed today's HDG Stories podcast. We encourage you to subscribe. We hope you will share with your friends. Till the next story, we invite you to visit us at hdgstories.com.